The story about the measurement of mentalization is very important in my opinion because it can serve as an excellent illustration about how we can use very complicated and obscure psychoanalytic concepts and turn them into empirical research that hopefully can give contribution both to psychoanalysis and to academic psychology. Mentalization was used as a concept for, for decades in French psychosomatics, in English psychoanalysis, and probably no one outside of these specific schools would be able to explain what it meant. In the mid-1990s, a group of researchers in London and New York City decided to come up with means for measurement, with psychological instruments that would enable us to measure the mentalizing capacity. This attempt was called Reflective Function Scale and it is developed by Peter Fonagy, Mary Target and Howard and Miriam Steele from New York City. It is something that requires time to learn. It takes a three-day seminar and then uh, coding and receiving feedback and improving until you become a re reliable coder. The RF scale is applied to interviews that uh, are testing someone's attachment quality. This is very important because mentalization is easy when you're reading a book. It may be easy when you're listening to other people. It's difficult in your own attachment relationships. It's difficult to think while your emotions are intense and when other people are very close. So this, mental, this reflective function scale is an instrument applied to your narratives about your current or previous attachment relationships. Then a researcher needs to look at four dimensions of what you are saying about your attachments. So one, do you see the nature of mental states? That they are not long-lasting very often, that you cannot be completely sure about what they are, that there is always a level of doubt about whether you can understand another person or your own feelings. Then two, whether you can see that there are mental parts of the behavior, whether you can see intentions, wishes, fears, emotions behind the externally observable behavior. Then number three, development. Do you see that things change about mentalizing capacity? Do you see that some things that annoyed you when you were a child now are not relevant for you? For instance, that your babysitter went away and you were hurt and cried, you now see was inevitable because she returned to, home, to her home country. And finally, number four, the understanding of the mental states of the interviewer. Does the person you're talking to ever refer to what he or she thinks they see on your face how they understand your questions, and so on and so on. The coding procedure, that I think usually takes between 30 and 60 minutes, ends up with a score. You get a final score of someone's reflective function capacity. This score is between minus 1 and 9, and I have to say I've never met anyone who's had a subject who scored 9. This is probably an idealized option that exists in Thomas Mann's novels or somewhere. Most people in community samples, students, people who are not uh, troubled by any mental disorder, will score above 4.5 or 5. So if you go to university, I'm not sure about psychology departments, but most other departments probably, if you go into the street here, people will probably score between 5 and 7. Clinical samples score below 4.5 or 5, so that acutely psychotic patients usually score minus 1 or 0, because in acute psychotic states you cannot see the difference 
between mind and external reality or physical reality and such stuff. Borderline patients usually score around 3 because they try to mentalize all the time. They have some kind of psychological theory about their states and other people's states all the time. Just there is a problem with their understanding, with their conceiving of it, so that their theories are wrong. What I've just said over the last couple of sentences shows you how much research has been done since 1995 in various domains, developmental, clinical, social, and so on. Thousands of people were interviewed by this adult attachment interview, and to a large number of these interviews, RF scale was applied. This is considered to be the golden standard of mentalization research when it comes to empirical research. And we consider data obtained in this way to be very reliable and we consider uh, that to be the way to go. Because the procedure is very demanding when it comes to time and finances and initially training, other researchers try to develop other approaches to this. Some of them were developed with the ambition to be tests, so that they can give an objective final result, which means that we can compare people, we can study individual differences, and say this person is better or worse uh, on this test than the others. Probably the most famous one is the Reading the Mind in the Eyes test, developed by Simon Baron Cohen. Although this test over time did not show very high reliability and validity. This is a test of 37 um, facial expressions or, or expressions in the eyes, where you have four answers to choose one which supposedly is the correct answer. And so you can have a final score between 0 and 36, and then compare to other people who are doing this. There are also tests about reading the mind in the text, in the voice, in the film, where you are exposed to different forms of material and you need to figure out what they are showing about the mind that supposedly is behind the stimuli. There are more and more self-report measures related to mentalization, where subjects are asked to say what they think is their capacity to do a certain thing related to mentalization. So this is a completely different form of measurement. We cannot say how good a person is, we can only say how good a person thinks he or she is. So what we get now is that we can study large samples, we can study hundreds of people without too much effort, does not take much time, does not take much money, basically there is no initial training required, yet the nature of the data is completely different. I'm not aware of any details about mentalization, but let me just mention that when it comes to intelligence, the correlation between the two types of measurement is about 0.3. So when you ask people how intelligent they believe they are, and then you test their intelligence, the correlation is just 0.3. Most of us, we believe we are much smarter than we are. Anyway, several of those questionnaires or scales were developed over the last several years, and they're more and more in use. The first one was developed for the German-speaking area and then translated into English. It's called Mentalization Questionnaire, MZQ, a 15-item scale that takes several minutes for a subject to fill in, and that supposedly, I believe, is being used more and more. Another one is the Empathy Quotient, developed by Simon Baron Cohen and his research team at the University of Cambridge a 60-item questionnaire, again takes probably 10 to 15 minutes from a subject, and it is supposed 
to measure three different things and that is cognitive empathy, emotional empathy and social skills related to empathy. Uh, two things that are important here in my opinion not all research and not all validations in different languages uh, show this factor structure to be solid and then this is focused on empathy and not mentalization proper this is borrowing an instrument from another research tradition in order to uh, assess to make assessment of mentalization finally there's mentalization scale a 28 item questionnaire again takes several minutes only validated and, and now being translated into several languages and with a subscale of motivation to mentalize not just on what you think you can do but how highly you're interested in doing it this is possibly important because the differences in motivation to mentalize may be very relevant when it comes to the choice of profession, when it comes to whether psychotherapy will be something that you would choose for yourself or not, and so on. And the research indicates that psychotherapists do not differ from the rest of the population, but by being better in mentalizing, or psychoanalytic psychotherapists do not differ from cognitive behavioral therapists in being better in mentalizing but in both cases people different in their motivation to use what they can do so there's a lot of research if i were asked to summarize i don't think i would be able to and that probably would take hours and hours but this seems to me to be a very important inspiration for the future development of everything that's somehow connected to psychoanalysis and clinical psychology.